Welcome to Marketplace with Charles, brought to you by Art of Skin Care, the company that brings out the beauty in you, and Kuisa Lodge, where dreams do come true, from deep in the heart of Mabalingwe Nature Reserve, as well as Grace Farms, your number one daily fresh produce. I am Charles Ngobeni. On Marketplace, we redefine your future by equipping you with tools that you need to achieve your entrepreneurial dreams. Each week we'll bring you insight from experts in different fields of business, from wise men and women of great stature. On today's program, we meet a pastor of the fastest growing church in Santin, situated in Johannesburg. The rate at which the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to fetch his bride is dependent on the response of the believers to the Great Commission. Jesus said, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all the nations, and then the end shall come. Matthew 24, verses 14. The implication of such a statement is probably one of the most misunderstood. If not, then why else will the church manage to tolerate the doctrine of holiness through poverty for such a long, long time? My guest will endeavor to help us look at this subject from a perspective that will make you see wealth in a different light. Help me welcome Pastor Tim Grish with me in your home or wherever you may be watching this episode from today. Pastor Tim, welcome to Marketplace with Charles. I've been watching it and it's a joy to be here even today. Thank you, though, Charles. You know, I, I followed you wherever you were preaching. And uh, the other time I visited your church, I marveled at the great work that you're doing. Oh, I'm so honored. You flatter me, but I'm honored. <laughs> but what makes you tick? What makes me tick? I think, I think I'm a teacher by calling, and so my emphasis is to try and bring the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ in such a way that it's practical and it's actually usable. And so there's a lot of emphasis on, at least from my perspective, on our identity in Christ and maximizing that identity to bring out the fullness of our inheritance as it, as it plays out in our world today. And so that has been my thrust. Of course, I'm involved in other things as well besides um, direct church, you know, but we try to bring the whole concept of the gospel, not just from the pulpit, but into the marketplace and every other area that we find ourselves. And that's how it's supposed to be. We're to live out the gospel beyond Sunday morning, beyond pulpit hearing, we to live out the gospel in every area of our lives. And so that's my drive. When you came to join us, you remember, it wasn't even a church meeting as yeah. it were, yeah. right? We brought the men together. We brought others who were also interested to focus on the business aspect because mm -hmm. we see its relevance. And the gospel is relevant in every aspect of our lives. It actually is. We, we spoke about the Great Commission in the beginning of the program. Mm -hmm. But the truth is that most of the pastors have been reduced into beggars for the sake of the gospel. You know, the other time you, you, I, I watched the TV station and throughout the whole preaching, there will be some rolling underneath, words coming out for donations, for money, we beg in different forms. And uh, one way or another, I also feel that um, we become slaves. Slaves to who? Slaves to begging. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Because we are beggars, and, and the guys that sometimes uh, finance us, when we beg, not God financing his own gospel, when we beg, you become a slave to them. Where has it all gone wrong? You know that saying, he who pays the piper dictates the tune. Exactly. So what you've just said is so true. So you have a lot of people who, because they are the ones that seemingly are funding the gospel, they tend to also want to decide what will be preached from the pulpit. And, and mm -hmm. I've seen too many pastors who are unable to speak the truth anymore because the people who are funding them are not in support of that particular truth. But I need to, I need to disagree with you a bit. When you say most pastors have been reduced to beggars, I, I have a different opinion. I actually do believe, 
um, in my experience so far, in my exposure, I have seen a number that are in begging. In a lot of churches, one of the key reasons why people struggle with respect to getting the people to give is because I personally believe that the people have not been taught. Over the years, I've been pastoring now for what, going on 25 years, I have seen that if people are taught to understand their responsibility to the gospel, the same way I was taught, I was taught my responsibility to the gospel. I went to varsity to study engineering, I have been involved, I, I run a consultancy firm, but even before all of this, I was taught about the necessity to support the gospel financially. And so as a result of that, even when I am in a service, I am not given to being cajoled, I am not given to being persuaded, I already know know that it's my responsibility to fund the gospel. When you talk about um, the different ways that we now beg, right? But let's be frank. Let's, let's really be frank. When you look at um, non-profit organizations that also put their desire for donations and put their request for offerings and for gifts and for whatever terms that they use, a tax deductible, whatever, do we say that they are begging? Or, or is it okay for them to do it and then it's not okay for a church to do it? Bearing in mind that the church is run on donations. The church is actually run on offerings. So, and even when you look at Paul's letters, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, are we going to say that Paul was also begging there? Because Paul was unapologetic about it. Paul actually said to the people categorically, the Corinthian church, he said, you need to give. And he told them that you have to give. And then he even used the Macedonian church as an example to them and said, can you not see the Macedonian church that they did not even have a lot, but they did give? Why won't you do the same? So I don't think it's inappropriate to actually put your details out there and ask people to give. I think the problem I have, and I think this is where I will agree with you. I was watching the TV the other day and the pastor came up and said, um, if you don't give, our show, our program will go off the air. We need exactly X and Y amount. And he was, he began that whole, you know, rhetoric mm -hmm. about why people needed to give to keep their program on the air. And I will not lie, I did feel uncomfortable with that. But at the same time, did he have a right to make that request? Registered as a nonprofit organization puts you in that position where you are supposed to make requests like that. I do think, though, that where we have missed it is that we have not taught the people to understand their responsibility to fund the gospel. That responsibility is scriptural. It can be seen in every book of the Bible from the epistles that Paul wrote, starting from the birth of the early church. I feel if people can be taught, if believers can be taught their role financially to the gospel, you will not need to do fundraising unnecessarily. You will not need to to start saying things like, um, and, and this is the one that grieves my heart greatly, um, give us a thousand rand for this bottle of anointing oil uh, to anoint your business. Give us two thousand rand for this bottle of water. You won't need to go in through all those gimmicks and those nonsense, because I feel that's nonsense, right, to begin to generate funding if you will teach the people. But uh, the, the challenge that I have as well, you, you, you find someone in a program like this who, who spend... 15 minutes. <laughs> Think I know where you're going. <laughs> Asking them for money. And then spend 10, ten minutes. minutes on the actual content. The actual content. <laughs> yes. You see, again, we have to accept the fact that we will not all do it the same way. Um, does it justify uh, for them to put more effort on the issue of money? I don't think so. The gospel has to be the center of what we are doing. But we also need to accept that it does take money to send the gospel out there. Yeah. But yes, it does leave you with a certain sour taste in your mouth when the whole show seems to be about raising that money as against time invested in actually sharing the word. Again, I guess that's why shows like yours do exist. I mean, it's also why people like you do exist. People like you who have taken it upon yourselves to actually fund the gospel. So besides the show that you do, I know that you are so involved in actually funding the gospel. And there lies the big question. How did you get here? What was that which you learned? And we need to find ways to help every minister of the gospel realize that if we can give people the same information, they will not need to make this kind of overt plea to use your words, overt begging yeah. <laughs> for money. It does leave a sour taste in the mouth. But then what is a true gospel then? 
Okay, what is the gospel? The gospel, we just came out now, I mean, um, a few weeks ago, we had our Easter celebration. Yes. And that was the introduction of what the true gospel is. It is the incarnation of Jesus, meaning the God becoming man. It is his death, it is his burial, and it is his resurrection. We should also add at some point, it's also his return. That is the gospel. Whether you are focused on the reason for his death, you are focused on the consequence of his resurrection, or you are focused on his return. Any aspect of this, what is ideal though, is a compendium of all of this, is the release of the gospel. And there is no gospel without taking it to the streets, taking it outside of the four walls of the church into our world. And for me, particularly in the last two years, that has been my focus. If we do not take the message of the gospel beyond our Sunday experiences and let the gospel appear on Monday. Let it appear in that office. Let it appear in that school. Let it appear in that mall. If we don't do that, then clearly we have not encountered the death, the burial, the resurrection. Talk less of the anticipation of the second coming of our Lord. That's, that's my understanding of how the gospel um, centers around and how it should be presented. Mm -hmm. And who would you say are the custodian of the wealth and the riches? Of course, we, we have to accept that the richest 1% of the people in the world are primarily, very few of them are actually born again. So the monopolistic industries that, that govern the world are not people that are saved. This is the key reason why the church needs to teach on finances. Do you know it's a major problem? Because I've seen a lot of financial conferences and when they teach on finances, the emphasis is always on the sowing and the reaping. Don't get me wrong, that is a major part of the gospel. You, you can't, you can't preach the gospel of our Lord without talking about investing your finances into what is called the fertile ground of, of the gospel. The challenge though is, when you teach on finances from the scriptures, it's a lot more than that. People need to be taught the place of engineering. People need to be taught the place of investment. People need to be taught the place of hard work. There's a plethora of things that need to go into that particular conversation. But sadly, we find ourselves not putting that on the table. So the custodians are, that have the money right now are people in the world, and they are using it to bully the church to come to a place where it's unable to actually bring out its thoughts. I mean, we're in a situation now where you post something on Facebook, cancel culture will cancel you, simply because it does not agree with the current ideologies of the people that back that particular platform that you have chosen to put your medium, and which is the gospel, on. So if there, is, if there was ever a reason for the church to become financially buoyant, that reason is now. If there was ever a reason, because the true custodians of wealth from God's perspective is the believer. The believer is supposed to, Deuteronomy 8, I mean, I'm sure you've quoted that so many times on this show. Deuteronomy 8, 18, it is he that giveth thee the power to get wealth. God is desirous that his children be prosperous, but he tells us why. He says, so that he will support the covenant, so that he will back up. It, the Bible also talks about how his kingdom will expand through prosperity. If we're going to get the kingdom of God to extend, to expand, it is through prosperity. If, if, if we do not become the heads of all the seven mountains, I'm sure in a show like this we've been talking overtly about the seven mountains, if we do not put believers who understand how to bring divine culture into the cultural environment of these mountains, if we do not put believers there, we will continuously be at the mercy of the people that control these industries. And we are seeing it today. We are really seeing it today. We're in trouble. <laughs> Someone once said, he who has the money set the rules. Oh yes, that has always been the case. That has always been the case. It's one of the key reasons why back then, in the ancient times when the, the Christianity was being formed, when the church began to have a lot of financial muscle, yeah. even the church became tyrannical. Even the church started acting like a tyrant. There is something about the power of financial freedom that if one is not careful, can bring the tyrant out of any individual. And, and I'm sure we know that. It can actually bring the tyrant. But it also shows us how powerful then money actually is. 
because when an individual is able to wield the influence of money, see, we, even the Bible talks about how wisdom is a defense. Then he says money is a defense. There is a defense that money gives that even if you did not have the support of friends and family, because you have the money, people will come out of the woodwork to actually give you the support simply because of that resource. That resource, we need to find ways to ensure that that resource is being used for the advancement of the gospel. We really do. You, you know, uh, uh, this scripture blows my mind, which says, uh, a poor man's wisdom is despised. <laughs> you know, and uh, it doesn't matter how wise you are. Even your neighbor, it says, even your neighbor does not even listen to you. <laughs> and yet you want to win your neighbor to Christ. Well, look, I, I will have to, I hear you there. And the person that made that statement, yeah. um, Solomon as it were, the yes. person that made that statement, in as much as there is a measure of truth in it, let's not forget that when Solomon was making that statement, his heart was already taken away from God. And that statement was based on his observation. So that's why in that story, he even tells us a story about it. He says there was a wise man who delivered an entire city. And then after he delivered the city, they forgot about him. And then he says, yes, the wisdom of the wise of the, of the poor is despised. But we've also seen how there are certain people who have not had any money. But because of their influence, because of their integrity, because of their commitment to the service of mankind, even though they have been without money, men have accorded them unbelievable influence. I'll give you an example. The likes of your Mother Teresa, the likes of your Mahatma Gandhi. These are individuals who, who they, they were poor. I mean, they, they were by all intents and purposes. If you went to their houses, you will not applaud them. But in spite of that, the world came to accept that these were still resources of wisdom that should be, that should be accorded to these individuals. So I hear what, I, I what Solomon said, but it's not the entire truth. But yes, there is a measure of truth in it. And again, a necessity for us to ensure the body of Christ requires financial support. So everyone within the body must begin to accept that God has given us the power to get wealth. And we must begin to get that resource so that we can support the gospel. But now, Pastor Tim, take me through um, the five different perspectives, you know, that defines the believer's uh, responsibility to the world. Yes. Now, one of the first statements that Jesus made yeah. to the newly birthed church mm -hmm which also, you will say, was one of the last statements that he made just before he resurrected, was in Matthew 28, 18 to 20. In Matthew 28, Jesus said that all power has been given unto me. Then in 19, he says, go ye therefore and preach and teach the gospel. And then he goes further and says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. When Jesus said, go ye, it was a command. It wasn't a suggestion. It wasn't an opinion. It was a command to every believer. Everyone, if anyone is watching right now and you've accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, we have been given the mandate to take the gospel to our world. God is not going to come back to preach any, any gospel to anybody. And he doesn't have to because he has you, he has me, he has every believer that's watching. When he said, go ye, he was talking about five things. We are to go with the word. And that is the first thing. That's why in that Matthew 28, he says that we go ye um, in preaching and in teaching the gospel. So we go ye with our words. We must be unashamed to verbally tell people about Christ. Number two, we go ye with our lifestyles. Your lifestyle must support what you teach. It must support what you teach. I see too many times. Now, I see, look, I'm a pastor amongst all the other hats that I wear. But I've come across too many pastors, for example, um, um, Doc, who will make statements when they stumble and fall. They make statements like, but I'm only human. Almost as if, look, I'm, I'm not disputing you're human, yeah. but almost as if people should not be so upset with us. Don't be upset with me. I'm also human. And I'm saying, stop saying that nonsense. 
Because the minute you stand in that position of authority, people look at you as the example. And yes, they should look at Jesus, but they will also look at you as the example. I'm not saying that pastors don't stumble. I am saying that we need to be willing to take responsibility and understand that where, where we stumble in our lifestyle, we cause other people to stumble with us. And this does not just apply to pastors. This applies to every believer. Once people know you are born again and your lifestyle does not support what you teach, you are a problem to the gospel. So we go with our words. We go with our lifestyles. We are also supposed to go with our finances. When the Bible, Romans 10 was saying, how shall they hear except someone be sent? Yeah. It takes money to send the gospel. Mm -hmm. It takes money to put a show like this that is blessing somebody right now. It takes money to, to do the crusades. It takes money to get into townships. One of the things that we do, we do a lot of township interactions. It takes money to do that. How do you preach to somebody the gospel when the person is hungry, when the person's um, children has been kicked out of school? It is easier to get a person to focus on what you are saying if you have put some food in their belly. It's a lot easier. It takes money to do things like that. So we go also with our finances. We are also expected to go with our gifts, with our talents, and with our skills. When I talk about gifts and talents, I'm talking about your innate abilities, the, the talents that you've been given to serve your world. When I talk about skills, I'm talking about your learned abilities. So did you learn something from a technicon? Did you have, do you have a degree? What, what are your skills? We are also supposed to use that to serve the gospel. And then number five, we are so also supposed to ensure that we go with our, let me get the five, with the miraculous power of God. It takes miracles. God still, do, God still does miracles. When, and, and, and if we, if we use, if we do one part and we ignore the others, our, we are not balanced. We are to do it all. All five must be active in our lives, Dr. Charles. All five must be active. You know, but why do you think is it that uh, you, you, you see people out there fighting and criticizing pros the gospel of prosperity? Okay, let's be frank. Anything that has to do with someone collecting your money will be fought. Before we even go into the abuse of prosperity. So whether it's the government asking for your taxes, whether it's your wife demanding more money, your children saying pay more this, any, look, it's human nature. Anything that demands that you bring out money for anything will be fought. So the church will be no different. Because if the church is demanding for money, people will say, why is the church doing that? Forgetting that the Bible even talks about how Jesus had an accountant, meaning money was being brought. You don't need an accountant if you are packing change. <laughs> you know, you don't. The Bible even talks about certain women, and, and when it defines them, the only definition it gave them, it said, who supported Jesus with their resources. So Jesus actually had, and for them to have noticed this woman, it means they were given a level of significance because what they were doing was important for the advancement of the gospel. But again, we cannot deny that people will fight the gospel of prosperity because we have seen its abuse. We have seen where money that should be used for the funding of the gospel is also being used to serve personal cults, to serve personal desires. Don't get me wrong, I do believe that if you are pastoring an organization, a church, for example, that is, that is extremely successful, successful in the way we term success in the world, that is, that is extremely successful. The, Paul makes it clear, you should eat from your success. So you should, there's nothing wrong with that. But when those resources are no longer also being used to extend the gospel, it is now at the, to the detriment of ensuring that souls are being saved, Lives are being transformed so that you can have the private jet, you can drive that car. Don't get me wrong, I, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with having the jet, driving the cars, but we must be able to look at the metrics we use to judge the success of a ministry and see that you are meeting those metrics, which will include the fact that you are fulfilling the great commission. Souls are being saved. And what would you say is the believer's uh, financial responsibility to the dying world. Uh, again, it's, I, I guess we have to go back to the fact that Jesus said we need to go and preach the gospel right. and it takes money to do so. 
every believer has been given to re the responsibility to actually preach the gospel. And sometimes you can't preach it to certain people because you are not in their location. So it will require money to actually send others who will or, or send the gospel in a medium that will go to the places that you cannot go. So it is of great necessity that the believer understands that they need to fund the gospel, both in their tithe, in their tithing, in their regular giving. The Bible, the New Covenant, even New Covenant speaks about tithing. Paul spoke about the people giving at the beginning of the week. Those was their regular giving. Paul even then spoke, uh, spoke about sacrificial giving. There is the place where you give sacrificially, where this, this is no longer convenient, but you give because there is a mandate to be accomplished. This, this is not, and, and I think one of the challenges that I, I have seen, and, and it's a problem for me, is when the mindset of the believer is to give so that they can get. It's almost like you have turned God to a slot machine. You've turned God into a casino. So I'm giving to get. And then when you don't get, um, you start saying this principle does not work. We need to shift that mindset. When I give, when I give out of my own personal income, income from my businesses, income from the things that I do, when I give to the kingdom, I give because I need to see the kingdom go forward. Yeah. And that, if, if that is not um, what every believer is experiencing in their heart, that look, I have been blessed by this sermon. I have been blessed by this ministry. I need to ensure that other people also are given the opportunity to be blessed by this sermon, to be blessed by this ministry, and to do so, I need to give to that effect. If we are willing to do that, then clearly something is wrong with our passion for God. Something is wrong. Pastor Tim, unfortunately, <laughs> every good thing has to come to an end. <laughs> and we ran out of time before we even knew it. If someone wants to get hold of you, get hold of your preaching materials and the, the books that are still on the pipeline, how do they do that? Well, our church is located at 93 Greystone Drive, but you can also catch us on our website. So we have, that's um, the COZ, charlioscazulu.org. Um, but I run a regular devotional, so we, we are quite active, not necessarily on Facebook, but more on YouTube. So a lot of our materials, we'll put them out there for free. Um, um, so you don't need to pay a dime. Just go into our YouTube channel, p.tim, and you will be given un, unmitigated access to our resource base, and it will really empower you. It really will empower you. Well, viewers, I will encourage you to follow Pastor Tim, and I'll guarantee you, your life will never be the same. I am Charles Ngobini signing off on Marketplace. I'm available on all forms of social media, well, see you next time and God bless you.